real pleasure to, uh, to host this panel and also to be back again at the Universal uh, Tolerance Organization's uh, headquarters here almost at the, at the Drummond Theatre to discuss uh, a, a, another very important issue. Last time it was the, the, the Muhammad cartoons and the Charlie Hebdo massacre. Today it's religious extremism. Uh, when former Prime Minister Shel Magna Bonovic began with his 22nd July uh, story and, and the Norwegian experience, that's for me when I also began to think more deeply about violence uh, and extremism and what causes a young white man brought up in Norwegian social democracy to murder not just other people of different faiths like Muslim, but to also murder white people who supported them and supported immigration. I've traditionally worked a lot on socioeconomic rights in human rights, but this event has really caused a bit of a shift in even my own personal focus and what I look at. We've had some amazing presentations here from people who are not only just learned, learned it in the field, but are actually working on a daily basis. And so uh, I want to hopefully draw out more of that experience and that wisdom, but also push the panellists a little bit uh, on, 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 on their viewpoints. And to start off by focusing, I should also say my name is Malcolm Langford. I work at the Norwegian uh, Centre for Human Rights at the University of Oslo. I'm also at the Centre on Law and Social Transformation at the University of Bergen, heading a centre there. I want to firstly start with the problems and then move on to the solutions. So what is the cause um, of, of extremism? And I'd like to start with Harass's graph over here, if I can. Because I think this, this really helped frame our discussion uh, today. And you identified... The next one? Is it this one here, the first one, um, your first, uh, your, the, the hump graph, okay? And the key, the key challenge for civil society and more broadly the state is to get a shift in people in this direction in terms of the underlying attitudes uh, that they have. But the question I want to pose is, what about the large proportion of people who engage in terrorism that actually start over here? And I want to read a quote uh, from a, a leaked, uh, I think it's a MI5 or CAA report, which gave some background on, on terrorism. Now you mentioned that there were approximately 40% who had um, mental health issues. But there's also a large group of, of young people who engage in, in extremist terrorism who are described by MI5's Behavioural Science Unit in the following way. It revealed that far from being religious zealots, a large number of those involved in terrorism do not practice their faith regularly. Many lack religious literacy and could be re regarded as religious novices. The analysts concluded that a well-established religious identity, paradoxically, could actually protect against violent radicalization. So I'm just, I think there's been an emphasis here on the sort of the plurality, plurality of causes of, 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 of extremism. I'm wondering how you think about that group that mm. goes from one end of the graph to the other, mm. sometimes rather quickly, mm. and how do your solutions uh, address them? Okay. Well, I, I was actually involved in some <coughs> of the data from that particular report, so it's, uh, uh, it's something I'm aware of. Um, mm quite a lot. I think if we look at moving the graph to the left and then protecting and ensuring that people stay in the graph, we need to first of all take it away from religion because rightly so, many of these people that join Islamist organisations don't necessarily initially join because they believe that they are practising Islam or want to practise Islam more. They join because they want to belong to a group. They join because they feel that they're going to get solutions. They join because they feel that this is their family. Losing one's identity and changing that identity is very, very important. And the narrative that he had talked about earlier on, the, the oppression and, and everybody creating the other, is very, very important in this. To protect the people on the left of that graph, not people on the left generally, not th those people, <laughs> but, but, but to protect people generally who are on the left of that graph, we need to ensure that they have, when they are approached by charismatic recruiters, when they have their grievances manipulated, when they are groomed to a particular political, with a small p and a large p, ideology, they've got the resilience and the ability to push back and say, you know what? I have other ways of expressing my anger. I have other pr ways of, of addressing my grievances. I'm not going to do it by joining your gang. And the way, one of the ways we do that is we call it primary prevention. An individual, any individual, and if we draw circles around the individual, 
the individual has contact with a number of people on a day-to-day -day basis. And it could be parents, it could be school teachers, it could be the police if they have been involved in criminal activities, it could be local government, it could be wider government, it could be the press, it could be a whole range of things. It's imperative that for all of the circles, and this is a training course that we've developed, which is a new training called Colterra, for the different circles, it's imperative that each circle or each, the people within the circle understand from a safeguarding perspective in the same way they understand how to safeguard against criminal activity, against their children taking drugs, against um, protection from uh, paedophilia, all of these things. Understand what the signs are and then understand what role they can play. And that is something that we're, unfortunately, I mean, I don't, didn't want it to be done through legislation, there is something called the CTS. Sorry, I'm taking. There is something called the CTS bill in the UK, which came into force, uh, which was passed in Parliament in February, uh, but has just come into to force in July, which makes it statutory for frontline organisations such as schools, universities, etc., to do something to recognise and do something. Now, I consider it a real shame that we've had to legislate to do that. Uh, what I would have rather preferred is that civil society recognised this problem themselves and did, did this primary prevention work um, in the same way that we did it with racism and do it on a day-to-day -day basis with everything else. Thanks very much for that. We'll, we'll come back to some of those points. I mean, just to take it on to, to Suleiman now, you're working on the ground uh, with young people. What's actually worked? I mean, we've had these sort of government programmes described. Uh, you're also at the coalface. Can you give any experiences or evidence of actually these types of programs working, whether driven by civil society or the state? Firstly, I think uh, there is a deficit in relation to addressing the positive aspects of living in the West, the liberal democracy, the rule of law, the, 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 the country that gives you sanctuary where you live in, and there is a massive movement in relation to, say, disasters, etc., that take place in other parts of the world the European and certainly the British government and the public are in the forefront of helping. And I think part of that has been lost in transition because what we simply talk about is the negative aspect of living in the West, but we very rarely talk about all the positive contributions that take place. Secondly, another part that I think there is missing from this is this issue about identity and the disjointment between the younger generation and the elders. So as an example, if dad and mom are downstairs in the living room watching a, bully, a Bollywood movie, as an example, and the son or daughter is upstairs with a laptop open. They're allowing the whole world into the bedroom, into their mind. Who is monitoring that? So there's a disjointment there. Thirdly, I think the issue around imams. When we look at the imams within a certain the Muslim sector is we are looking at it from a very Judeo-Christian point of view, where within the Judeo-Christian point of view, the training of the clergy or the rabbi Part of pastoral care is part and parcel of that. But within imam training, they seem to concentrate more on the spiritual without the issue around civil society. So are they best placed? And if they do have a role, and I do think they have a role to play, are we empowering them? Or are we simply saying out in the wilderness that you as an imam of a particular organization have a right to talk about this particular issue and address it? But do they have the, are they necessarily equipped for it? So I think there are many other obstacles in the way that I think we need to overcome as well. Okay, you've named there the role of, 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 of religious leaders, and uh, Shil Magna Bondovict identified himself as a, as a Christian uh, pastor. Um, how is it, easy is it to come from a particular religion and engage in re religious dialogue and, and, and reform the way we teach education in school? I mean, you come from the party uh, Core F, which has been somewhat resistant, for example, to Christianity being, say, the dominant... Uh, uh, sorry, having a plurality of religions... Uh, in, in teaching rather than Christianity having a more, say, dominant place amongst those other religions. And it's been a struggle within your own political party as to how much teaching there is uh, uh, of different religions in a particular curriculum. I'm wondering how you reflect on that struggle, say, within Christianity in trying to ensure a more, say, pluralistic dialogue. For me, there is no contradiction between having your own religious faith and respecting that Norway has a humanistic Christian cultural heritage on the one hand, and to integrate people with other religions on the other. And my experience from dialogues with the Muslim leaders is that this is not the problem. They respected me very much. 
knowing that I am a Christian, even uh, an ordained pastor. And meeting Muslims in Norway, they are respecting that Norway has a Christian cultural heritage. That's not a problem. Um, it's more the agnostics and atheists who are uh, reluctant on that. Uh, it is possible, in my view, to combine respect for our Christian cultural heritage and integrating and respecting minorities. It's, 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 it is possible. And I talked about the curriculum in our uh, schools. We have now a um, subject uh, where it's said that about 50% about Christianity and about 50% about other religions. I don't see that as a problem at all in the country with our background. Uh, the main thing, uh, I, I think that parents of children come from other religions, they fully respect that in our country it's fair to have an education about 50% about Christianity, the other 50% about the other religions in a country where 80-90% belong to Christian congregations. So um, this has been very interesting for me to meet uh, people from other religions, and we have some, some in the panel here. Let me also say, if I could just yeah. make some other remarks, that I fully agree when Mr. Nagdi said there is no one, not one single reason for, uh, for extremism and radicalization. I think there are many reasons. And therefore, it's no single answer to this challenge. We have to address different causes. But I do agree with you that foreign policy is important. It's my experience as a politician traveling in, uh, in the Muslim world that, for instance, the war, and in my view, it was a great mistake. The invasion of Iraq is used and is misused because, of course, there's no uh, uh, execution for violence, but it is used against the West uh, for violence. Israel-Palestinian conflict, the Israel-Palestinian conflict the same. No doubt. I've met it. Many politicians who I've met in the Arab world coming back to the Israel and Palestinian conflict as an excuse for violence. Uh, and we have one with Palestinian background here, so uh, it's interesting to hear you on that. Uh, let me also say that theological justification for violence is dangerous. And that means that we have to do a job to uh, approach imams and other religious leaders to avoid that. Let me end up uh, this intervention by saying that I think the word belonging, which you also used, is a key word. If people do not belong to a group, feel excluded. I, and that was the case with Anders Bering Beivik. Uh, that may pave the way for radicalization. So the civil society has a great challenge. And I know that here in Drummond, civil society is encouraged by the politicians here to include immigrants and people who don't feel belonging. And I think that is key for meeting this challenge. Thanks very much, Shomag. You want to make a short point? It's very, I just want to make four very short points. Yeah. <laughs> very short. First of all, uh, foreign policy. Anyone who's telling you that they're doing it because of foreign policy is lying. It's a bit like somebody who's going to a doctor's and says, I have a sore throat uh, or a headache, and the doctor gives him a paracetamol but doesn't treat the throat infection. Yeah, he will go with a headache and complain of that symptom. Again, foreign policy, the Western foreign policy, has got nothing to do with Syrians killing other Syrians. If it was foreign policy, Israel-Palestine, he should be a terrorist. He should be. He should, he should, right now, we should be worried about him blowing us, us up, but he's not. So that's one thing. Secondly, Muslim leaders. Wow. That's a bit colonial. Take me to your leader. <laughs> we need to get away from that. We need to engage with people who are Muslim in the same way we engage with everybody else. The third thing. Um, so talks about parents. There's three girls from Bethnal Green in London went to, uh, went to go and join ISIL. Uh, 15 years of age, one girl called Amir Abbasi. Her father was pictured on the BBC website with a teddy bear crying for her to come back. I believe he wants her to come back. He went to Parliament. 
Keith Vaz, one of our politicians, took him to Parliament to give evidence, and he blamed the police, he blamed everybody else. Three weeks later, a video came out. When she was 13, he was taking her to marches for a prescribed banned terrorist organization called Al Muhajirun, who, at that march, burnt the British and American flags and were carrying the black flag. So he has a responsibility for that. And the final one, I, I, something I, I want to throw something contentious in. Yeah. Islamophobia, I reject that, that word. I reject that word with a passion. I am a Muslim. Islam is a set of ideas. It's a set of values. It's a set of what you, where you can go to a way of life. I choose to accept that. I choose to follow that, those set of ideas. In a liberal, secular democracy, no idea is beyond scrutiny. Islamophobia, the term, is quite often used to criticize legitimate debate within Islam. I'm an Islamophobe, by the way, according to some people. But I pray. I do all the things. I believe all, in all the tenets. But what I can't change is the color of my skin. And what we really do have a problem in Europe with is anti-Muslim bigotry. That we need to address. But just like other faiths, Christianity, Judaism, all the other faiths can be criticized and can be scrutinized in a liberal secular democracy. My faith, Islam, should be exactly the same. So I reject that term with a passion. Thank you very much. So four, sh <laughs> four short points with four large implications. Uh, many things are there. Let's just go to foreign policy for a moment, then we're going to come back to sort of de-radicalisation. So Loretta talked a lot about um, the rise of um, ISIS, ISIL, however we're going to, to, to talk about it. And I think your analysis is really important by putting political economy into it. So we have, we have extremism and terrorism all over the world in all sorts of different contexts, but when it's actually economically financed, it goes to another level. And you gave the example of, of FARC, you could perhaps add the Taliban, and now we have um, uh, ISIS. Um, and so obviously we need to look at political economy as, 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 as a key area, the financing uh, mechanisms. Um, so I want to ask you two, two, two questions. One, should we have frenemies? Should we have what? Frenemies. So what we see, a lot of these groups emerge because um, my enemy is your enemy. Okay, so the US basically finance you know, Al-Qaeda uh, because they're fighting uh, the Russians. We see the same dilemma now in, in mm. Syria uh, and Iraq, where also Western governments are willing to cooperate mm. with terrorists if they have a, a, a common enemy. And then we see the implications. So one, what do we need to learn from this? Should we just say no uh, and, and, not, and not engage in this? And secondly, you left us sort of hanging at the end, sort of like for a solution, because you basically said, well... You can't cut off financing to, to, to ISIS. Um, so how, how, how do you... And the, but the West is failing. So what would... Do you have any uh, recipe for success? Well, I think uh, what we have to establish here is the fact that um, armed organization uh, from you know, the end of World War II onwards uh, have been all one way or another, you know, state-sponsored. I mean, we would not have had this explosion, let's say, of terrorists, you know, in the 70s in Europe and now in the Middle East if people were not bankrolling the various groups. So we are responsible for doing that. Now, what we're doing at the moment in Syria is exactly the same thing. I mean, we got into this game last year you know, before we let our allies in the Gulf managing the actual financing of these organizations. Uh, and then, you know, um, last August, we decided to get directly involved. The involvement is, on one hand, using the drones, and on the other hand, you know, bankrolling certain groups that we believe are, you know, closer to our ideology, or, you know, there will be fighting to protect our interests. Now, having said that, ISIS, really, it is our product also, because if you remember correctly, in February 2003, the United States, the Secretary of State of the United States went to the United Nations with proofs coming also from the United Kingdom that there was a link between Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein. That link was called al-Zarqawi. Now, all of that was false. Now we know none of this information were true. Al Zarqawi had nothing to do with Al Qaeda. But that was sufficient to turn a very small jihadist 
at the moment, at the border, you know, in the Kurdistan, in Iraqi Kurdistan, into the most important terrorists uh, on earth. Now, funds started to move away from Al Qaeda, the historical Al Qaeda, which was, you know, could in the middle of the tribal region, um, they could not move because of intervention by, you know, the United States and the coalition forces. So all the money went to Al Zarqawi. Now. Who was Al Zarqawi? Al Zarqawi was a member of radical Salafist group called Tuaid al Jihad, which was born in 1996 in Jordan. Now, that is the group from which ISIS comes from. It is exactly the same ideology. Al Baghdadi fought together with Al Zarqawi. He ran for a short time a village in the Sunni Triangle where he experimented what is doing now with the caliphate. So we forget that. We forget that we created this monster. Now, personally, if I were a politician today, I would ask forgiveness for what I've done. Because we have really done terrible, terrible things in that region. We destabilized the entire region using that model of war by proxy, of course. So we wanted to go into Iraq no matter what, because we wanted regime change in Iraq. There were no weapons of mass destruction. We could not find them. So we had to find one other way to do it. And that way was to construct, to construct the mythology of al zarqawi which actually was a nobody. And today, we're paying the consequences. So do I have a solution? I think you know, the first step should be to apologize. The first step should be to admit that you know, we made terrible mistakes. I mean, Tony Blair lied to the United Kingdom, lied to the par parliament, lied to the nation, and lied also to the world together with George Bush. Now, you know, we may think, oh my gosh, you know, we can't possibly do this because that you know, would put our democracy in crisis. So, yes, this is true. But imagine if you are an Iraqi, um, a Syrian, somebody, you know, there under the bombs of the drones. Maybe he's a member of your family. You are here refugees, but you have families there. People still trapped there. Uh, what do you think these people think? Of us. I mean, what do you, so the radicalization, sorry, I get really emotional about this because I'm Italian, I guess, but you know, <laughs> I've been doing this for so long. But the, the, the real thing is we must understand that the radicalization is not only linked to the person, it's also linked to the environment in which the person is. I mean, it is fundamental where you live, what you learn, how you grow up, how you keep your ties with your country of origin. Now, if you, let's imagine somebody from this country, from Norway, that becomes an immigrant because something terrible happens in Norway. And then, you know, you are far away. And then your family talks to you and say, well, you know, today a drone came and destroyed completely, you know, the, the, the east side of our street. We're afraid. We don't know what to do. How do you feel about that? We forget about this. So I think the first step is to say sorry. Well, thanks for that very powerful uh, intervention. I'm actually Australian uh, by background, and one of the longest struggles in Australia is to get white politicians to say sorry uh, for the disenfranchisement of, of Aboriginal people. And, um, but it's been a key demand of, for people, and sometimes those symbolic acts have great significance. But that takes us back to uh, sort of forms of radicalization. When you know, and the, and the problem that foreign policy mistakes are used to legitimise uh, violence. So I want to come to your really, your, your great seven, seven steps, which is, I mean, in the literature on, on, on the causes of violence, this is very much a lot of the current thinking in terms of cycles of hate and getting people to move through cycles of hate uh, th through, through to violence. But what I want to what I want to perhaps uh, put to you is that there are many cycles going on simultaneously that seem to be building up each other. And so you have other groups who are also moving through their cycles of hate. 
which then catalyzed the other groups to go further down, say, say that ladder. It was interesting when I saw your, your ladder, I was thinking about Donald Trump, D Donald Trump, who's running for president in the USA. He actually comes to number five <laughs> on, his, on, on, on your ladder in the way he talks about Mexicans. I mean, it, he actually, it, all five points are met. So then you've got the people who are being, you know, offended at that and, and tempted to move towards six and seven. H how, do, how do you move back down uh, that ladder uh, uh, in your view? Well, let, let me start by, uh, uh, by, by pointing to a recent uh, uh, article. You know, uh, ISIS publishes an online magazine. It's called Dabaq. Uh, and I, I think a few months ago, they actually published a, kind of like a report about how successful they've been. And uh, the, the sentence they used is elimination of the gray zone. This is the thing, they, you know, when you have this polarized viewpoint of the world, it's either black or white, categorical thinking. It's us or them, with us or against us. The real risk really, really here, I mean, if you actually count how many people died because of, uh, you know, extremist attacks in Europe or, you know, around the world, it's actually less than automobile accidents, right? Mm -hmm. The real risk is what this does to our societies because when you know, extremism on one side inspires counter-extremism or, you know, a reverse extremism on the other side, and they basically start eating at the gray zone. So what's the real risk is if we lose this, if we lose this, this togetherness, if we become, if we start to think in terms of black and white, and if we take that, and if it infects our political systems, if, if we take that into politics to the point that we lose our liberalism. This is, this is the main thread that, that, that worries me. Uh, but going back to your question, how do, you, how do you go back? It's, I mean, we've heard some excellent presentations today about, you know, about uh, different approaches, and many, many people are doing great things, but I think, I think it's important to, to, to point, instead of pointing what should be done, we should point what should not be done. Uh, anything that amplifies one of those seven steps is going to be a negative. Anything that makes you feel more isolated, more otherized, Anything that makes, that makes you feel that you're threatened because of your identity amplifies your feeling of, of that identity. I mean, some people, I mean, uh, Haras mentioned uh, this very poignant example with his, with, his, with his daughter when she was seven years old. Uh, and I bet if she was 17, she wouldn't have reacted the same way. Maybe if she was 17, by the time your identity is formed, you don't, you don't reject the identity, you grab onto it more. And this amplifies this, this otherization and otherness. And this is why it's important to be culturally sensitive around the, these issues. Of course, within the context of rule of law and within the context of, you know, of liberal democracy and secularism. Uh, the other point is when it comes to oppression narratives, if our, our, you know, uh, if our approach to, to extremism is only security-minded, uh, in fact, I'm going to say it this way. Security-minded or security-only approaches to radicalization are one of, the key, one of the main causes of radicalization because it, the, the community feels that it's being attacked. So it, this kicks up the oppression narrative. They start to feel that, you know, they, they actually feel the oppression narrative even more. It amplifies it, and they become more radicalizable. Of course, radicalizable does not mean that they're going to be eventually radicalized, but as I said, it's basically a continuum. Maybe they will stop having as many non-Muslim friends. Maybe they will, you know, they will, they will shut down, they will, they will consider emigrating, you know, to, to, to another Muslim country, etc. cetera, not, not as a radical, but, you know, basically they don't want to live there anymore. So it's, it's a continuum, and I think it's important for us to have that, that level of nuance. Now, if you allow me, I've been taking some points, as the others <laughs> spoke, and since uh, they, they ate into my time for the speech, I think I can eat into their time now. Uh, foreign policy was mentioned, and uh, I lived all my life in the Middle East. And I come, I mean, if I count my her heritage, I'll have to count eight or nine countries, and all of those nine countries don't want me, and that's why I'm stateless. <laughs> I'm a refugee, actually. Uh, so foreign policy is, in fact, I mean, you cannot tell the story of how ISIS and Al-Qaeda uh, uh, rose. And you cannot even, you can, actually, you cannot tell the story of Islamism without talking about colonialism and imperialism. However, this does not constitute a justification. And this is coming from me as an Arab Muslim. Uh, I feel, I mean, I really, it's, this really upsets me when I feel there is this bigotry of low expectations as what could be expected from an Arab Muslim. Uh, it, it feels like, you know, you, you've been oppressed, so don't shoot that high. 
don't think about being a liberal. Just, just, you know, just stop be killing people and that's, you know, you're going to be fine, you know. I really, don't, I really dislike that. I really think that uh, part of the debate here, you have to listen to Muslim voices who are as, who are probably more threatened. I mean, ex extremists kill more Muslims than non-Muslims. There is actually a higher chance that I'll be targeted. Someone like me or Haras will be targeted uh, uh, by, by jihadists than anyone else in the room. You know, because the, we, we are the ones who are challenging them, and this is why they, 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 we become the front line, you know, when they want to, when, when they want to head back. Uh, so, you know, just to summarize that, this point about foreign policy, foreign policy does play a role. It does play a role more for people in the Middle East than here. And for people in the Middle East, uh, it affects their lives in a direct way. It's not just images they see on, you know, on, on the screen. It actually affects their lives in a, in, a, in a real way. And I think it is a concern. I mean, we should have a humanitarian, uh, humanistic foreign policy, whether or not this problem exists. But I think we cannot take it out of the debate as if it's irrelevant. Uh, can, I, can we take yeah. those points and just push them to the other panelists? Sure. And I'll, I'll give you some time at the end. Is that all right? Sure. Because I, I want to put, put those back to Sir Haras and to Shell Mongna, um, who are both working closely with the state, or previously with the state, in trying to tackle violence uh, and, and extremists. And how do you deal with this, this problematique of trying to uh, use the full range of policy areas, including criminal law and, 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 and policing, but risking also that you provoke a backlash because the state uh, is dominated by the majority community and in, and in Europe that means you know it's usually white or of Christian background. So how do, how do you navigate this? I noticed even the in the presentation by FRP uh, State Secretary this morning, he said well we, we have 30 different policies but the police based approach was at the top and that's actually what dominated most of his discussion today. So yeah. how do you navigate that? Uh, start with Shil Mongnit. Well I'm not sure if I uh, grabbed your main point. <laughs> But can you... I suppose, so do, do you, you want to um, use all policy mechanisms to combat ex extreme violence, including using the criminal law, the criminal justice system and police. But as we've just heard, that can also have a backlash effect. The same as you also want uh, white liberals to be critical of, of violence, but that might also create a backlash if we're seen to constantly criticise the Muslim community. H how do you navigate uh, uh, this difficult policy terrain? Well, of course... You have to use criminal law against crime, no doubt. Mm. Uh, but that is not the main means to combat violence. Because if you should succeed in combating violence, you must address the root causes. Uh, and to use criminal law is not to address the root causes. Uh, so that is only to combat uh, the outcome of, uh, of a thinking. So it's, for me, much more interesting to discuss what are the root causes of uh, extremism and radicalization and how can we address that. Uh, I think, as I said, not a single uh, reason. And Baghdadi's um, roadmap, I think, was a good explanation of that. <laughs> huh? This Baghdadi. It was your roadmap uh, of seven points, and I noted them, and I think all of them are more or less uh, uh, reasons here. But I think you also summed it up in a way that's saying that if some people feel more worse than others, they are already radicalized. And that is the main point, I think. And as a Western Christian, traveling much in, in countries in the Arab and, and the Muslim world, very often I meet uh, the idea that we in the, they believe that we in the West feel that we are more worse than them. Uh, and that is a main point. So for me to teach human dignity, equality, is a main mean to combat this root cause of, uh, of extremism, no doubt. I, maybe I disagree with you. Uh, Mr. Rafik, but I do mean also from my experience that foreign policy plays a role, no doubt. No, I, I accept that it plays a role. Yeah, yeah. it plays a role uh, uh, because, like it or not, but Iraq, Israeli Palestinian conflict are, you can say, misused uh, as an excuse for violence, no doubt. 
And since um, uh, Madame Napoleone um, touched upon Iraq, I was prime minister at that time. And I had long discussions with George W. Bush and Tony Blair about this. It's no doubt that the invasion of Iraq was built on a lie. Because they used the argument of weapons of, uh, of mass destruction, and that was the only mandate they had, of course, because of all the UN resolutions, but they had didn't found any weapon of mass destruction when they invaded, and they have not found any weapon of mass destruction all these years after. It was built on a lie. We know wh why they invited, invaded, and that was a, a wish of a regime change. That was in contradiction to international law and order. And of course, many people in the Arab world have not forgotten this. They have not forgotten it. They became angry, and they use it, and we can say misuse it, as the excuse of violence and terror, no, um, no doubt. The same with religion. In my view, religion is not the main cause of extremism and violence. But political leaders are misusing religion. And they can misuse some religious leaders as well, who have an interpretation of Islam that can be used for these uh, purposes. Well, um, Mr. Rafik, you said you don't like the word Islamophobia uh, because it's used to, uh, to, to fight criticism of Islam. Religion and criticism is fair. We can criticize ideas of Islam as we can criticize ideas of Christianity. But it's no doubt that also in Norway you have Islamophobia. And with Islamophobia, I don't mean criticism of Islam, of course, but people who are afraid of another religion without knowing so much about it. Uh, and you have had this even in a Danish textbook saying that all terrorists are Muslims, but not all Muslims are terrorists. They had to change this, of course, because it was a lie. Not all terrorists uh, are Muslims. You can think of Sri Lanka and Northern Ireland and so on. So, well, uh, so, but it's no doubt in my view that uh, theology is, uh, theology, uh, is used as a justification of uh, extremism and, and violence. So, um, to end up, um, I believe in uh, mobilizing the civil society as a main means to fight extremism and violence. It's limited what politicians can do. Civil society can do much more because they are meeting people every day and it is a challenging of including uh, young people, especially immigrants, who feel that they are not belonging to any group to let them feel a belonging, let them feel equality and that they are not leave them with a feeling of humiliation. Because if feeling humiliated, I'm afraid there will be extreme. Let's go to some, to some uh, let's take two questions and then uh, we'll get some final responses from the panel. Um, I just, actually, I wanted to make some comments um, while Mr. Bonovic is here. <laughs> uh, I have, I'm a language teacher. And so I see myself as a part of that civil society, and I'm very concerned about the rhetoric that we used, as Mr. Nagdi said. Um, the fact that we use, very often we say Islam and the West, I find that extremely problematic. We're comparing a religion with a region, which is of unfair comparison. Um, Islam is not contradictory to the West. Islam has been in the West for centuries. There is no contradiction between an Islam and the West, and we need to stop using this rhetoric, Islam and the West. There is no contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hold that taxi for a minute. Um. <laughs> Just before I leave, if I could comment on that. I see your point, but on the other hand, the reason, and I agreed with former President Mohammed Khatami of Iran to use that wording, Islam and the West. Why? Because the West is not now a Christian region. We have, as you just pointed, several uh, religions in, in, uh, in the West. So when we should have a dialogue, for instance, between him 
and me and our foundations, we had to find the right wording and to say Islam and Christianity was not the right wording because the West is not now a Christian continent. That was the reason behind. Yeah. Got a second comment? Um, oh, uh, we, we know that. Can I make a second comment? Very, very quickly and then, uh, yeah. I'm just very, also very concerned with this. I, this um, as, a, as a teacher myself, I, I often find myself wondering, should I, should, are we allowed to use this word? Uh, is, uh, sorry, did you use the word Islamism? Islamism, yeah. Islamism, yeah. Uh, you say that we should use it and that we should name it for what it is. Uh, some other panelists said that it's dangerous to, to connect Islam to what is happening in radical terrorism. Uh, the word radical itself as a language teacher is not a bad word. It comes from Greek, which means root. So to be rooted is extremely good, actually. So that's another thing. We need to, we need to think about the words that we use in debates like this. And I really need to get some clarity on whether uh, Islamism should be used or not. I also think that it's important that white people, and I'm sorry I'm using that term, but white European people need to start also naming the problem. It shouldn't just be the Muslims. A white person should not be called a racist for saying or for, or for using a word like Islamophobia or Islamization, or whatever you said. Thank you. We go, we'll take our, uh, another comment here, and we'll have some, some final statements. So. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> uh, my question is going to go to Mr. Haras Rafiq and, and Suleiman Nakadi. Uh, according to your uh, experience in uh, extremism, as we call uh, do you think that uh, leaders, uh, faith leaders in Islamic communities or in the world could come out one day and condemn the terrorist attacks like what we have seen in Paris and uh, in the movement in Nigeria by the name of Islam? If, if yes, if you think they're going to say yes, do you think that it means there has been a little room in, uh, in those countries like to allow the liberal to speak out? Like now you are free as a liberal in the Western world talking uh, free, but I think somewhere it's not allowed. Can you explore this question? Thank you. So thanks very much. Um, we're just going to finish with some final statements and you can address which comments you have in a very short period of time. We'll start from the... From, from the left here, from the left, and, and move through. Well, I'm not sure about uh, uh, what to say about the use of Islamists. Uh, I, I think uh, my book, uh, my most recent book in English is called The Islamist Phoenix. So uh, clearly, I do believe uh, that we have to differentiate. In Italian, you have um, a different expression. Uh, it's actually fundamentalism. So you know, when you talk about uh, the degeneration of Islam through armed organization, uh, you don't use the word Islamist, you actually use the word um, fundamentalist. So you call Islamic fundamentalist. That immediately gives you the idea that you're talking about armed organization or extremists uh, and not you know, about Islam. So I think it depends on languages. So I don't know, the, the, the lady, I think she's gone. But uh, I mean, I don't know in uh, Norwegian what's the, the word. I mean, how do you differentiate in Norwegian the is, Islamic uh, from is, Islamist? Do you have a... It's, a, it's the same as in English, the way the discourse yeah. here is in Norway. So you use the same kind. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, I tend to... Uh, to agree that we need to differentiate that way. It's absolutely has nothing to do with Islam per se. Uh, of course, you know, we're not referring to, to, the, reg to the religion of, of Islam, but it is a way to say that there is a degeneration of that concept, uh, and that degeneration is described as Islamist. Um, I have no problem about that at all. Um, maybe this is not the best possible tools, but uh, the semantic 
of all of this. Before, you know, when I gave my little talk, I, I described uh, all the different ways that we are addressing the Islamic State, Daesh, or whatever. Because this is a recent phenomenon, I mean, we may think that this has been with us for a long time, but this is actually you know, a very small amount of time that we've been dealing with this kind of phenomenon. So I think you know, the language has not adapted yet to a proper definition. So I wouldn't say that uh, we are attacking or you know, we are referring to Islam. Um, on the contrary, I would say that we are differentiating from you know, the true Islam to its degeneration. Too much final comment, Tess. Okay, um, I have certain concerns with using the word Islamist or jihadist, and I'll tell you why. Many people from within my community, especially the young that are growing up, would link it, this is my fear, link it with something that will be allowed within their faith because the vast majority of Muslims, whether you believe it or not, except those that come from the Arab countries, will learn the Quran in relation to using it spiritually for prayer and not necessarily understanding it. So any word that comes out that sounds slightly Arabic and sounds as if it's come from the Quran itself gives it some sort of legitimacy in relation to that, and language changes. We heard the issue around uh, the uh, language around how does language change? It changes over time. If I just give you one example very quickly, when I came to the United Kingdom about in the mid-70s, I could remember, and this is on a very sort of lower level, Mum would cook a chicken. And the neighbor next door would say, what's that stink coming from next door? Today is no longer the stink of the curry, it's the aroma of the curry, because we've changed the word from stink to aroma. Can you see how language plays its part? And when we talk about radical, certainly in the 70s and 80s, if you look at the manifesto of both the Labour and the Conservative government, all talked about creating a radical Britain. Now you would not find a politician dead using that particular word. So we have to be careful. These words have certain connotations and certain meanings to people. It's not per se that I have a problem with the word, but I'm fearful that if the word used elsewhere, and the comment that you made, sorry, around would Muslim leaders speak out? Well, there are Muslim leaders worldwide who are speaking out against it. Media is not necessarily on our side. But there is a difference between the imams, in my opinion, who live in, in Europe compared to other parts of the world. I come from southern Central Africa, so I know the imams and how they approach it in relation to South Africa because they were part of the anti-apartheid movement. I know some imams in the United States because of civil liberties and how they manage to venture into some of these subjects. But the ones that predominantly come in this part of the world are sort of the first, second generation that came from the subcontinent. Maybe they don't understand the context of it because they have not evolved through that. So I think it will take a while for them to be fully fledged members in relation to what you talk about. You don't have to comment on Islam, isn't it? Just have a final comment. Well, interestingly, I'm, I'm, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up on the same, yeah. the same topic, which is the words used. Interestingly, in Arabic, there is no word for Islamism. Islamism in Arabic, the, you know, which, which we're supposed to be referring to, we say Islami, which means Islamic, not Islamist. Uh, and the interesting thing is, because if you actually want to say it in a way that is unambiguous, you, you say Islam siyasi, political Islam, or politicization of Islam. The problem here is that it's not only the radicals, so-called radicals, who politicize Islam. The tyrannies, the dictatorships in the Middle East, all politicize Islam. They all use Islam for legitimacy. Basically, they're old-style dictators. They're not religious reformists, as they try, to, they try to present. They're just old-style tyrants. They're willing to use religion in any way to, you know, to maintain legitimacy. And I think this is the part that so far has been missing. Uh, the dictatorships of the Arab world are some of the greatest creators of the environment that breeds radicalization. And However, they're, rad they're basically legitimized by, by, the, by, by world powers. They're sold weapons. They're sold, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, advanced uh, weapon systems. And nobody is talking about this. We, we, if you want to, it, it's going to be futile if you're going to, uh, to, to talk about terrorism without talking about tyranny because they inspire each other. Uh, the, the, our tyrants, every time we get rid of a tyrant, we get another tyrant thanks to our terrorists. And every time we get rid of our terrorists, one of our terrorists, we get another one thanks to our tyrants, and we're stuck in this circle. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah. Some very quick points. The word Islamism, why is it important and imperative that we actually use it? When a leader stands up and says, what ISIS are doing has got nothing to do with Islam, 97% of Britain 
turns around and says, you're lying. Why are you lying? Because they say it's got something to do with Islam. We must use the word and we must differentiate. The Muslim Brotherhood use it. The Ikhwan al-Muslimin use that term. That's where it's come from. We haven't invented it. We must use it because the general public, if we don't use it, will polarise the debate and say, it's all Islam. The reality is, what ISIS is doing is coming from an interpretation of scripture, which is in Islam. It is. I'm a Muslim, I reject that. I was, I, we're translating their textbook. It's 600 pages right now of how they indoctrinate the first thing they teach their foreign fighters. One of the things in there is they use a hadith to turn around and say that if somebody is different to you and you're hungry because you're in Dar al Harb, you're in a state of war, you can kill them and eat them. And they use religious justification for that. We cannot get away from the fact that they're using it and we must use the term ourselves. Otherwise, the far right will use it and they'll say it's Islam. That's number one. Number two, you, you asked a, a really good question about how do we, um, uh, something about the, the, the security side of things. Yeah. The civil society movement, the moving the graphs to the left, has to be taken out of the hands of the police. The last five, six years in Britain, we've, we've looked at, the, the government has looked at this problem purely through the lens of security and legislation. Well, guess what? We have in between 700 and 1,000, uh, or whatever the number is, because nobody actually knows, of foreign fighters that have gone out to Iraq and Syria. Yes, we do need security, but if we want to shift that graph to the left, we have to move it away to and civil society by using other government departments. Uh, final, final thing. Oh, faith leaders, there are many fatwas. Uh, I, I recommend uh, Sheikh Tahrul Qadri, who has a big following, who did a fatwa, uh, recently a large fatwa, uh, big Pakistani following on condemning uh, uh, terrorism. And it was Al-Qaeda in those days, not just ISIS. And the final thing for me, Actually, two things. Grey zones? Absolutely. That's the key. If you look at all of the military direction and all of the top commanders, what they're talking about now is fighting within the grey zones. And that doesn't always necessarily involve military action. It's about propaganda. Again, there's a report on our website, the Virtual Caliphate, which looks at the theory behind how ISIS are now doing their propaganda. Only 3% of it is barbarity. The majority of their propaganda is based on mercy. And the final thing, I will accept anybody's... Foreign policy, I'll come back to that. Foreign policy, yes, of course it's a symptom. Of course it is. I, I was against the Iraq war. We must... Okay, I will believe that that is a cause for somebody taking sex slaves. If somebody can convince me why and how an American drone dropped a bomb on somebody's next-door neighbour and then he or she decides to go and take a sex slave with one of the neighbours. He or she decides that, oh, that other Muslim is not the same as me, I'm going to chop his head off. I'm going to stone them to death. If somebody can show me how that link happens because of foreign policy, then I believe it's the only cause. But what I'm saying is, it is a, it's something that's utilised and manipulated, but it's not the root cause, it's a symptom. And that's something we need to recognise. Take that since you asked how, how to make the link. We'll have, we'll have, we'll have to uh, finish there because of time constraints. We're going to continue the debate. I just want to say, today we really focus a lot on this, what I would call the supply side of, of, uh, of, of extremism. And, and many inf important points about dealing with the charismatic entrepreneurs or recruiters that are, uh, that are recruiting young people. We're dealing with the internet, with shifting the discourse to expand that grey zone. But also for Western governments to acknowledge their own complicity in creating a discourse and, and, and grievances that can be easily used of, of tyrannic governments in the Middle East also creating the conditions uh, for tourism. I think all these things are very important. I would just say one thing about the demand side. If many people going into violent extremism have mental health issues, if many of them in fact come from gangs, Okay, they've, been pre they've dropped out of school, they're involved in gangs, they're involved in drugs, they're into pornography. If you look at the backgrounds of many of these, or if you look at those who are just searching for some sort of religious meaning, a place to be where they find that meaning, then we also have to think about how do we reduce that demand, which is then met by the supply of uh, sort of radicalism. What about our mental health programs? What about our ways of dealing with young people, giving them constructive alternatives? Uh, do they have places where they can find uh, real meaning? And so I think also we need to think about, the, again, the, the complex causes in thinking about de-radicalisation. There's not only uh, one solution. So that's just my 
my perspective there at the end. But I hope the debate continues. It's already started. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can move forward constructively uh, on this issue. Thank you very much to the panellists. <laughs>